Good afternoon, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Pay respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship to one another. Welcome to the final session of the 2021 Plant Phenotyping and Imaging Research Center, or PERC, Symposium on Flagship 4, Field Imaging for Phenotyping in Plant Breeding and Precision Agriculture. PERC is funded by the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, or CFREF, and led by GIFs on behalf of the University of Saskatchewan. My name is Kirsten Bett, and I'll be facilitating this afternoon. I'm a professor and plant breeder in plant sciences at the University of Saskatchewan, and I've been working with the PERC group since the beginning and have learned so much and developed some really interesting collaborations within and beyond um, PERC. So I'm very excited to see um, some of the, the work that uh, is being done by, by certainly this group, because being a plant breeder, but also um, all the others. The talks from our speakers this afternoon have been pre-recorded and will play back to back, followed by a live Q&A once they have all played. Please direct any questions that you may have to the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. And once the Q&A starts, I will draw from these questions to spur on discussion with our speakers. We have five speakers this afternoon. Our keynote is uh, Darren Howey from Trimble Inc. In his role as director, global business development with Trimble, Darren is working with farmers and ag business around the world as the ag industry navigates the rapid pace of change and adoption of new precision ag and production technologies. He will be joined by Ari Marena, research assistant with PERC, Keshav Singh from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Tuan Ha from, the, from our department, uh, Plant Sciences at the USASC, and finally, Albert uh, Ugo Chung, Chung, whoa, sorry, um, senior economist, policy fellow, and international development professional at the Center for Study of Science and Innovation Policy at the Johnson Choyama Grad School of Public Policy here at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, and now for the presentations, I hope you enjoy them. Hi, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, this important and uh, timely discussion today. And, uh, and I'd like uh, to thank you for the kind invitation to to join as well. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, moving toward a sustainable future and in particular with agriculture. My name is Darren Howie and uh, I have 21 years combined between AgriTrend and Trimble. I joined Trimble in 2015 through an acquisition of the company that I was the president of as uh, AgriTrend. Our business was uh, focused on agronomy and marketing software solutions and uh, and a portion of the business was also around carbon offsets as we helped farmers monetize uh, monetize the the uh, information and the data and the practices they were using uh, particularly in Alberta in the in the compliance market my roles have moved from uh, in, in I've had various roles around strategy business development partnering uh, managed businesses and staffs and, and focused on global growth. And today, I'm the Director of Carbon and Sustainability for Trimble Agriculture. Trimble is focused on partnering with customers to optimize task and productivity to transform the way the world works. We enable real-time sensor and data integration to create seamless system workflows across a number of different industries. Trimble is, is the world's first company to commercialize uh, GPS, and uh, we started in 1978 with our founder, Charlie Trimble. We've moved from GPS technologies to precision positioning to productivity optimization, and today extremely focused on connected workflows across a number of different industries. Our company it, uh, produces about $3 billion of, uh, of revenue, about over 1 billion of that is in services and uh, annual licensing. Uh, we trade on the NASDAQ and have over 11,000 employees working over 150 countries. R&D drives much of the company with 15 countries uh, having R&D facilities. Uh, investing over $400 million a year in R&D with over 2,000 active patents. 
I'm extremely focused on agriculture uh, and somewhat in forestry and the natural resources sector. Um, but we also work across a number of different uh, um, industries. Construction with a, with a major joint venture with Caterpillar for providing uh, technologies uh, around construction, both software and, and hardware um, uh, capabilities. Uh, geospatial and uh, uh, survey, uh, which includes uh, uh, positioning services uh, with a, with a um, major initiative going on with, uh, with Cadillac right now for their uh, autonomy program. Uh, we work in, uh, in a number of different transportation uh, avenues as well. When we look at agriculture, and really our focus is on uh, crop production ecosystem, and we span the entire ag ecosystem. Many know Trimble from easy steer and autopilot and, uh, um, and guidance and, uh, and the equipment that is, is in the tractor cab for guiding and, and, and driving equipment. Uh, but today we have uh, um, many sensors across application equipment and, uh, um, and across the entire ecosystem. Uh, correction services with RTK and RTX services for enabling uh, variable rate application and, and, uh, and uh, um, steering, as well as connectivity to the cloud and farm management software. If we think about what society is asking, asking of, of agriculture and of our food supply, society really requires a food supply that is plentiful, inexpensive, and high quality. But at the same time, we're being asked to provide sustainable food system, climate smart food farming practices, food security in light of recent events with COVID, it's really put major pressure on, uh, on uh, food supply chains um, and, and, and ensuring that there's traceable and transparent food production globally is our key considerations of what we're, we're asking our, our food supply to deliver. This is really driving agriculture and farming activities to adopt digital technologies to provide a consistent level of crop production record keeping, documentation for the use of current climate smart technologies and adoption of new technologies that give society the insights that they demand. At the same time, we're seeing companies make major carbon pledges and carbon commitments all over the world. Uh, to date, we have, uh, at the end of last year, actually, there was over 200 major uh, uh, global companies that had signed on to Amazon's climate pledge, um, as well as you know, um, signatures onto the sustain, um, science-based targets for carbon. And today, in, in 2021, in fact, the demand for uh, joining the science-based target initiatives is outstripping their ability to, to bring companies on. And, uh, um, and we're seeing the entire world rush to, to uh, both define their commitments and, uh, and drive towards implementation of those commitments. But it's not just commitments today. Uh, initially, there, was a, there were many pledges that, and there was some doubt on, on whether uh, those commitments held uh, would hold companies and countries to account. Um, and today we're seeing examples of, of uh, youth suing the German government to meet climate pledges. We're seeing Shell, who really is a leader in, uh, in uh, the oil and gas sector on climate smart uh, um, technology and, and, uh, and really leading, leading the world, but is, is being held to account by, in this case, a Dutch um, Dutch court to um, broaden, broader and deeper commitments. So how do businesses address their emissions? And the, um, the initial way that companies would meet their, their pledges would find efficiencies to reduce scope one to three emissions or um, supported by these compliance markets. So scope one emissions are from direct on-site sources like manufacturing and, and their buildings. Scope two emissions come from energy and utilities. So companies look to, to both adopt uh, uh, different forms of energy 
or reduce their energy consumption. And scope three are come from around indirect emissions from supply chain and services, really working with both suppliers and customers to help initiate uh, processes to, to reduce, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Companies have these climate obligations, but that cannot achieve those targets through scope one and three, look to the offset market to get to their net zero uh, balance sheet commitments. Um, there's many industries and many companies that find offsets as unavoidable uh, or use offsets for unavoidable or too expensive emission reductions. And indeed, offsets uh, have been uh, are seen as a way of hitting our net zero commitments. And when we look at uh, um, some reports, this example from McKinsey that shows that uh, to achieve our, our 2050 targets, we'll need to have negative emissions or offsets that would, would be used to, to meet those climate commitments. And in a number of industries, it's just not, um, it's, it's not only is it not um, practical, but in some cases it's not possible to uh, reduce, um, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. For example, we're gonna continue to use concrete beyond 2050. We're gonna continue to have transportation, even, uh, even as we change our uh, fuel consumption and fuel um, um, types will still have uh, um, some emissions coming from different sources. And so offsets can form a way of us achieving our commitments and, our, and the need to get to where we need to get to in 2050. Soil sequestration has a high potential and is gaining traction as a method for reducing, uh, reducing carbon. Soil organic carbon, removed from the atmosphere can be, can be stored in soil. And this, this study shows where the greatest potential for storing soil carbon is in across the earth. It's estimated that over two gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year can be removed from our, um, from our atmosphere through improved soil management. That's over, 30, over a third of the global agriculture greenhouse gas emissions. When we go beyond soil sequestration and, and, and add in other management practices, there's a number of ways that we can reduce um, and, or cause natural cooling to occur. When we look at protecting forests and grasslands, uh, there's, there's estimates that that could, that could drive an additional four gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. Restoring forests and wetlands could add another two gigatons. But the, our focus is really around these working lands. And if you think about protecting uh, forests and, and grasslands and restoring forests and wetlands, what we're doing is we're, we're saying that we're going to produce the world's food supply on a shrinking number of acres. That puts additional pressure on those, on those acres to not only produce the food supply, but do it in a climate smart way. When we look at these nature-based solutions, they become critical as we look at the trajectory of where we're going with, uh, with climate change. The current trajectory looks like we're going to uh, hit a 3%, 3 degrees Celsius increase by 2100, where nature-based solutions can help, uh, help move us towards our goal of 1.5 degrees uh, by 2100. But the time to start making some changes is now. So if we think about what can we do uh, to, to achieve our goal, and really this is the same with any technology goal, there are certain things we can do today, there's certain things that we can, we can drive towards tomorrow, and there's other things that are in the future that we maybe don't even foresee what, you, what those are today. When we think of some of those things, current technologies and techniques, um, we can use, we, we need to scale those, those technologies and techniques to drive forward. Things like nitrogen management, reduced tillage, cover crops are widely seen as ways that we can today take active steps 
to uh, change management practices and, and drive towards lower emissions. If we think out in the, in the near term, there's technology available that may require some adaptation and that we can start to move uh, maybe some, some technologies and try and scale and adapt those to a larger, a larger group of, of growers. Things like nitrogen reduction products, even carbon measurement to better understand how management practices and products can, um, can, uh, um, um, can help solve these problems. If we think out into the future, there's technology that we don't even know about today that needs to be invented. Things like nitrogen fixing corn could have a major impact on our carbon emissions. And we're gonna to need to get some of those things in place to achieve our goal. But if we think about where we're at today, carbon offset credits for nature-based climate solutions can help achieve net zero. They can incentivize farmers to move towards climate smart practices. They can speed adoption of technologies and they can allow time for new technologies to emerge. There's major challenges with the protocols, however, as nature-based solutions are hard to measure and they rely on credible models for verified data. If we think about a wind turbine with a monitor, we can monitor how much energy was produced from wind turbine and calculate what, the, what that means from a greenhouse gas. We can go to a meter and read it. When we think about nature-based solutions and soil sequestration, it's very difficult to go and, and read a sensor to determine what happens. So we use models and data to verify those, those nature-based solutions. There's four major criteria for a nature-based solution and a carbon market um, to emerge. And uh, um, number one, the, the model needs to meet credible international standards for greenhouse gas emissions of the reduction or removal compliance. And there's some key tenants of that, which is additionality, permanence, and, and leakage to ensure that, that those greenhouse gas emissions actually did occur. They must meet buyer's confidence to exchange for dollars. They must be registered and, be and have the ability to be retired and ensure that there's no duplication so that buyers have confidence to enter into a market or into an agreement. They must have the ability to be implemented in practice. And there has to be existing infrastructure or, or available infrastructure, and they have to be scalable for a market to exist. And, they, and for sure, a key element is the price point for the producer must be attractive enough to provide the data to be verified. The Alberta compliance market is an example of where a, a, a protocol can be implemented and, and scaled. Uh, the market in Alberta started in 2007. It enabled farmers to aggregate uh, carbon credits back to 2002. And we saw dozens of companies come into that market to begin to help farmers to monetize their data and to help drive change in the marketplace. Over time, a number of those companies have, have, uh, have moved away, but there's still two players in the market that are, are helping farmers as they, as they monetize that data. Today, Alberta has recently announced that they're moving away from these, from these carbon credits, but you know, the infrastructure has been, has been solid. When we look across Canada, as I just mentioned, the Alberta Conservation Cropping Protocol ends in 2021 due to a 40% adoption criteria on additionality. Um, that that uh, additionality requirement has, uh, has put an end to that protocol as it stands today. In Alberta, there's also a nitrous oxide emissions reduction protocol uh, in, in version two form that is currently approved, but has, has not been um, adopted uh, due to some, some abilities to implement that protocol in the field. It was the same with version one. About 10 years ago, version one came out and we were involved in a pilot to take that to the field and, and, uh, um, and pilot it with some, some growers. Uh, we found there was some uh, 
some components of the protocol that didn't allow uh, that the infrastructure wasn't in place. Uh, the second version of that protocol came out in 2015. And again, we came, came back to the regulators with some um, suggested changes in order to, to move forward. We continue to have, um, I guess, version two under review. In Saskatchewan, despite years ago having legislation put in place, we, we still have not had, we still do not have an approved protocol in place. And similarly in Canada, we don't have an approved protocol. Approved workable protocols are needed now to put us on a trajectory to, to achieve our 2030 and 2050 commitments. The, the Paris Accord and the, and the, uh, um, there are, there are agreements in place for uh, offsets to be a portion of the, of the, uh, of the uh, offset program. Nature-based solutions um, are, 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 can be a key driver. Society demands that we take meaningful steps to address climate change. Nature-based solutions have been identified as desirable to help us achieve those, those targets. Agriculture sits ready to participate and companies like Trimble are ready to support with technology adopt, support the technology adoption and support country and companies' climate commitments. However, today there's a lack of a clear direction and effective protocols to move forward. And our, is, our industry is asking regulators, registries, and the science community to come together toward a sustainable future. Hi, welcome to my talk on supporting the exploratory analysis of image-based phenotyping through visual analytic tools. Plant and soil researchers seek to answer questions about crops by analyzing field data collected through growing seasons. Traditional methods of measuring crop phenotyping characteristics are usually based on visual ratings or manual assessments, which are time-consuming and labor-intensive. At PERC, we've been using high throughput phenotyping platforms such as unmanned aero vehicles or UAVs, which are then paired with image detection uh, and cementation techniques, which offer a low cost alternative. It's capable of extracting plant phenotype information from individual images from uh, plot trials and plots. While some aspects of phenotyping data comparisons are computational and can be automated, expert human judgment is still vital for analysis and hypothesis, hypothesis generation, and visualization tools can assist researchers in this task. Here at PERC, we've been developing web-based applications that will assist PERC researchers in collecting and collaborating and user, using their data. In analyzing this field data, the ability to compare data across varieties and treatments or locations is essential. So with those requirements, the rest of my talk then focuses on, on how we've been working with several groups of crop researchers at PERC to understand the requirements for these interactive and visualization tools to support their crop fintech activities. Most of what we built is already part of the plot vision platform, a software designed to quickly assess a large number of field plots and collect crop information from UAVs by using AI. The plot vision platform helps agronomists and breeders manage and analyze their data. Here, we see an example of a canola trial from 2018. So to recreate some of the typical observation processes that we see in the field, we made it easy so that users can simply click on an image. This then shows an expanded and interactive, interactive overview of the field. Users can zoom in to, expect, to inspect different areas. Users can also view the earth mosaic with certain filters applied, such as NDVI, excess screen, NDYI, and other results. This can also be interacted and expanded. And expanded. Uh, beyond the overviews of the field, we have also developed a custom plot level exploration tool called the plot workspace. Uh, this tool supports the exploratory analysis phase for generating hypotheses. It's got support for image retrieval and viewing, simple access to, the, to all the results, and you can compare and visualize data values between plots and replications all across a growing season. We also made it easy to track the analysis process by taking the idea of a, of a lab notebook, and it allows you to take notes and support collaboration through visualization state snapshots. So in my following slides, I'll go a little bit more in detail about these features. 
At the plot level, users can select a specific plot from the main overview and inspect it at various zoom levels. Users are also able to explore how the AI system analyzes and produces results by viewing plot images based on different uh, vegetation indices. For example, uh, this process allows the users to compare a base RGB image to how the AI uh, system identifies flowers or produce an NDVI result. Field studies usually involve complex travel design and field layouts, so researchers should be able to compare plots, replications, and different locations. In our tool, users can select plots in the overview to select all the corresponding plots for a given treatment, and this will then highlight it on the summary charts, allowing them to compare results ac across different treatments and varieties. Other comparison methods allow users to select a specific result, which will then generate a heat map style overview on the plots. In this case, for example, plots with the highest crop volume appear darker. Additional panels in the system already do simple statistical tests based on the generated results from our system. Uh, we have also ensured that our analysis tool includes a permanent record of your explorations to enable communication between collaborators and to enable easy re revisitation of a previous uh, exploration session. Here, we see a previous session loaded from the snapshot panel, which was, showed, which, which was saved at a previous date, and it enables uh, collaborators to then share these with others. An additional note-taking panel is also available through the toolbar, uh, taking the idea of a lab notebook, Resources can write down quick reminders or interesting notes of what they viewed in the analysis. Through the feedback we've already received, these simple additions uh, have enabled collaborators to be able to hand off analysis between each other. In certain cases, it's already enabled easier onboarding of new students onto the platform. Beyond our plot vision platform as well, we have also now started to work with satellite imagery to build interactive apps using the Google Earth Engine platform. While there's a vast amount of data available, we're working on a collection of apps that will enable crop researchers to view data beyond what is usually uh, captured by UAVs. And this can also be expanded to larger areas of interest. All of the apps mentioned above, both Plot Vision and the Google Earth Engine apps, are available through a range of dates that will allow researchers to go back and inspect the environmental conditions that may have caused certain results. Before I finish my talk, I would like to say thank you to the Plot Vision developer team led by William Vanderkamp, Ian Stalinus, and Carter Goodwin, the Crop Imaging Lab led by Steve Shirtliff, and of course, uh, Gives and the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining my seminar today. Here, I will give you a brief overview on the potential application of digital imaging technology in plant phenotyping. I have tried to keep it simple to address all the audience. Hope it will work. Here is an overview of this presentation. I have structured it into different points. Firstly, the need and strategies of high throughput plant phenotyping for COP genetic gain. What is the hyperspectral imaging technology? The overall presentation is divided into these listed selected case studies. These are the strategies for crop genetic gains set by Plant Phenotyping and Imaging Research Center at the University of Saskatchewan. So they are working in four different themes. First is a mobilizing root soil microbiome interaction. Second is genomic and physiological selection of yield stability, field phenomics for breeding and precision agronomy. And last is deep learning for phenomics using the artificial intelligence based tools. Hence, there is a sensor based uh, advances at different scale. First is a greenhouse based automatic control phenotyping, uh, ground-based field phenotyping using proximal sensing, drone-based field phenotyping, which is the aerial-based systems, and last is satellite-based crop health and precision management. So there is a elite breeding germplasm and new genetic diversity. After integrating all these different themes, one can achieve precision agriculture, deep plant phenomics, and, cl and climate resilient crops, which gives the way of data revolution in agricultural sustainability.
The hyperspectral imaging is the combination of spectroscopy and imaging from a distance. Generally, the hyperspectral camera collects all the subtle information in hundreds of wavebands as shown up here. So this is the hyperspectral cube having X and Y as a spatial axis and lambda as a spectral axis. You can see the single plot hypercube. So the basic difference between multi and hyperspectral is the multispectral sensor generally collects information in a discrete manner and hyperspectral collects all the information in a continuous way. In the first case study, we have worked with Carola seed point maturity using UAV based hyperspectral imaging. This study was done in summer 2018. 56 genotypes of the canola was planted by AFC in AFC farm in Saskatoon. For this study, five commercially grade genotypes were selected, which were NAM 0, 13, 17, 48, and 76. UV data were collected at five phenological stages along the seed color change of 0%, 25, 40, 60, and 75%. Using on the UAV fly day, we have collected the plant for calculating the pod and seed moisture manually. Using the hyperspectral imagery data, we have deployed canola pod maturity index, which is the function of blue, red age, and near infrared band. So we have plotted the pod moisture versus the canola pod maturity index and found a good square relationship of greater than 80 percent. Here, the, when the pod moisture is less than 30% and, and the index value is less than 0.1, this gives an indication of canola swathing or ideal time of the harvesting to the farmers. And we have, uh, we have also found as an index change attributed to the moisture and seed color chain, it helped the breeders to make selection of the genotype based on the maturity and also determine proper timing of the spraying of the dead chicken. This study is recently published in the Canadian Journal of Remote Sensing. Uh, in combination of previous case study, some portion of the trial were used to estimate nitrogen use efficiency among canola genotypes. Four varieties, including NAM and hybrid genotypes, were seeded in Canadian Research Farm in Saskatoon in summer 2018. Four nitrogen doses were applied in the soil. Here, we can see how the nitrogen fertilizer flows from the soil to the plant and in the atmosphere. The UV hyperspectral data were collected at different time points to measure the treatment effect. This is an average reflectant profile per plot from different nitrogen treatment. The nitrogen reflective index were used to classify the field imagery data to identify different doses effect on canola genotypes. The overall study could help the growers to gauge how much nitrogen they should be applying per acre to optimize the final grain yield. In the second case study, we have developed a spring wheat yield prediction model using UAV-based hyperspectral imaging. This study was done in summer 2019. 15 spring wheat variety was seeded in Cunning Farm in Saskatoon. Here you can see the hypers retrieve hyperspectral reflectant profile of all the 15 spring wheat varieties at the flowering stage. The UV data were collected at the five uh, main stages, which was jointing, booting, heading, flowering, and ripening stage. Along with this, five uh, UAV flights, we have collected the ground sampling data of the leaf chlorophyll, head moisture, and the final uh, final yield. The partial least square display analysis were used to classify the 15 spring wheat varieties. The We have chosen the four machine allied algorithm, which was artificial neural network, partial least square, support vector machine, and random forest to train the hyperspectral data with respect to the ground rating, which was leaf chlorophyll, moisture, and the yield. And we could able to make a yield prediction model using the different uh, machine learning algorithm at the different weight of, of different stages. Hence, we have found the partial least square treatment analysis is a promising tool for wheat varietal discrimination. The overall result provide a better band selection methods. The maximum weightage was re retrieved by artificial neural network, which is 60 to 100 percent. And the flowering stage got the maximum weightage of 0.5 for, for yield prediction at R square of 82%. The third case study was about the wheat stripers assessment using UAV based hyperspectral imaging. This study was done with Professor Randy's group in the wheat stripe nursery in Saskatoon. We have started with four checks from resistant, moderate, resistant, moderate, susceptible to susceptible. So average reflectant profile of all the checks were plotted with respect to the uh, with respect to the wavelength. And we have used the first order derivative to identify all the prominent changes in the wave bands. So on the basis of those prominent change wave bands, we have identified the main uh, vegetation indices and those vegetation indices value were plotted with the ground truth rating of average severity. And we have found that leaf 
plus uh, this is severity index is giving the maximum r square value of 0.93 as compared to the other index in this project eight herbicide treatment responses in lentil desiccation were studies for the experimental design a small red landed variety cdc maxima was seeded eight herbicide treatment listed here were studies for the ground rating visual desiccation and lentils uh, plant moisture content were measured the UAB data were collected at five different data points after the treatment, including the baseline. The partial least square data point of all the different herbicide treatment were plotted to measure how they move from their control. The equilibrium distance from the control were plotted along with the different treatment and date after the treatment. As an outcome, the equilibrium distance shows a comparative herbicide response in dry down of the lentil faster. Ammonium nitrate has the most quicker effect from 3 to 24 days after the treatment. Glyphosate effect starts slowly and attain the highest up to the end after the treatment. And, more, uh, and the maturity index observed as a surrogate of equilibrium distance. Now I have finished my presentation. Thank you everyone for your time. Hi everyone. Thank you very much for coming to my talk today. My name is Tuan Ha, a research associate working with Professor Sirliff at the Agronomy and Crop Imaging Lab. First, I would like to thank our organizers for inviting me to this symposium. I am here today to share some methodologies developed by myself and our students on crop phenometric uh, extraction using uh, UAV imagery. At our lab, uh, about 20 teta tetabyte of image were collected each year. So batch processing is necessary for extracting plant phenometric. So far, we have been facing a lot of challenges, including uh, plot boundary and vegetation index extraction. So in coming slides, I am going to show you our methodology to overcome this issue. Now start with the first example on plot extraction of, lento, of a lento herbicide child. This child is characterized by high variation in ground cover and plot spacing. So we start with NDVI calculation and then using line detection algorithm, we find the crop rows. And then from this crop rows reason, we use NDVI and threshold to locate the plot with the high biggest NDVI index. And then we locate the low NDVI index plot by uh, intersect between the horizontal rows and vertical rows. So from there, we got the final plot as you can see in the graphs here. And move to the other um, example here. We uh, conduct a study on lentil subplot boundary uh, extraction. So our major challenge here was that we have high variation in uh, plot spacing as you can see here. Other than that, we have high uh, crop overlapping uh, among subplot and the subplot are very uh, small compared to the plot uh, as you can see in the previous study. So we propose a workflow uh, look like this and using the same approach, we can have plot boundary uh, for the uh, at, in yellow, as you can see in here. So from there, we find the center of the plot and uh, create a new um, center line. From center line, we assign uh, the plot reason uh, above and below uh, reason. And then the key thing here is with the set segmentation, we can classify uh, lentil crops versus non crop. So from this polygon, using the spatial resolution, uh, spatial um, uh, relation to the reason uh, plot in here, we can assign the subplot, uh, it look like this. So from there, we can then extract the uh, lentil phenometric, uh, some phenometric uh, look like this. Uh, the next is an example from um, Hans Ni Fernando, a master student from our lab. Uh, she explores the potential use of UAV imagery in canola geo prediction. And she found that NDYI, a popular index for quantifying flower uh, pixels, is not suitable 
index for our current input images. Uh, as you can see over here, a lot of um, crop shadow were captured into NDYI. So that's why we develop or propose some new indices. Uh, as you can see in here, are uh, some new um, output map uh, in which um, all the noise from crop shadow and background were eliminated. So in the box plot, you can see the um, value range of flower in the new indices are well separated so that we can threshold or classify easier. Um, and then we can also, this can also help us to enhance the accuracy in geo prediction uh, using uh, canola flower. Here is another story from uh, Brianna, a master student from our lab. She conducted a study on lento of phytotoxicity using UAV data. NDVI were used to quantify the effects of herbicide, but the problem here was that NDVI in the set uh, area has been increased uh, a lot, as you can see here in the set uh, region. So, she proposed a mask index for the set or set region using the ratio between the green and red bands. Um, so that she can have a better NDVI index. And uh, from there, she can quantify the effects of herbicide rate on different lentil varieties. As you can see in here are two varieties with uh, different effects uh, of uh, depends on the rates. So uh, that are some examples of uh, our work. Uh, please contact us if you have any further question. Thank you very much uh, for the attention. Thank you everybody for coming for this afternoon presentation. Um, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me to present this topic titled Fair Principles and Data Sharing in Bioscience Research, Implications for Food Security. To set the ball rolling, I will start by describing what FAIR principles is all about. I will talk about the policies and practices that promote FAIR practices and the implication of FAIR principles for data sharing and food security. The acronym FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These four cardinal principles have 15 sub principles that that were created to enhance the production and use of quality scholarly data. They apply to all the general resources of other product of research, including data images and software, and also provide guide, guidelines for data stewards and managers in defining and providing quality criteria that data must meet before being deposited in any digital repository. The, this slide shows the sub principles under the four cardinal principles, which I will describe in subsequent slides. The first is findable. Data findability implies being able to locate data online. And metadata should be easy to find by both machines and humans. To find data, data sets should be assigned a globally unified and persistent identifier, such as the digital object identifier. And this must be indexed in a searchable resource, some such as Google or Medline in the issue in the area of health research. Data should be described with a display data. This context, uh, provides contextual information about the data and should be stored in a secure location, which could be general, structure specific, institutional, or even domain specific. Accessibility principle. Data should be accepted from a repository by the identifiers using a standardized open and free communication protocol such as the HTTP, which makes room for authentication and authorization when necessary. Metadata should be accessible even when the original data or resource is no longer available online. For, for interoperability, which is defined as the the ability to integrate data from different, resource, different sources without losing its meaning. This framework is important, especially in interdisciplinary research or data development that costs across 
disciplines. It is considered the most difficult due to differences in standardization of coding variables, data format, among others. And it is a major attribute of a good data quality data and this that can stimulate collaboration. However, a key challenge in interoperability of data is lack of common standards and protocols arising from data, different divergent needs of data, or a situation whereby files are created using proprietary software that are protected. This could make data interoperability a difficult one. Data optimizing data usability is actually the key cardinal objective of FAIR. Therefore, for any data to be reused, it must be accessible and released with a good better data. Although application of data FAIR principles have not been a common practice in many disciplines, including bioscience, policies are important drivers of fairness of digital data. There is need for increased awareness about FAIR principles within research communities, and there has been an agreement on the internal needs of FAIR practices. Internal policies, methodologies, community shared standard tools, infrastructure and training that promote fair practices should be developed and adopted. There are also need to develop community governance frameworks for data and digital resources. And this should be based on the priority of the organization in the use of data research. Example of these policies is data governance, which is a collective set of decision-making process for the use and value management of an organization data sets. Due to heterogeneity in organizations and their priorities, this varies from one institution to another and stipulate the minimum threshold of fairness, common standards and guidance that we facilitate data harmonization, sharing and reuse. Therefore, appropriate data governance principle is required to produce high quality data. For interoperability, the data, the data should be prepared using appropriate common data vocabularies and recognize open file format for integration between such communities. For usability, there should be policies that mandate provision of sufficient metadata and accessible data usage license. There's also need to prepare data set in structured and machine readable formats to increase its findability, accessibility, and usability. And as a matter of policy, at the beginning of the project, data management, coordination, validation, governance, and interoperability should be considered to facilitate implementation of FAIR. Last but not the least, there is need for incentive and reward system for FAIR practice by individual researchers. Implications of data sharing and food security. Making high quality data openly available for reuse is a strategy that will enhance monetization of data stewardship. Integration of data from multiple sources will no doubt promote research collaboration on data use. A typical example is the area of plus phenotyping and genotype, genotyping. This holds a promise of delivering a more accurate, precise, and efficient breeding selection process that will definitely enhance food security. Conclusively, creating digital data that can easily be found, assessed, synthesized with other data, and readily be used we no doubt increase advancement in bioscience research. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to getting your questions. We are back live with our panel of speakers who are all looking forward to answering your questions. A big thank you to Darren, Ari, Keshev, Tuan, and Albert for their terrific talks and for being here to answer questions um, live from the attendees. I'll be pulling questions from the chat. So go ahead and ask away all your burning questions or maybe not so burning questions. And uh, and so I, there's already a few um, questions that are in the chat, but and we'll start with those, but please do add some extras as we go along. So um, Darren, Carol, uh, Carl Goodwin has been has asking, um, is the precision ag market already saturated or is there such, is there still a lot of opportunity there for technologies such as location sensing and things like that? Yeah, I think when you uh, uh, start looking at precision ag market, it's, uh, you know, the precision ag terminology is, is very broad. Uh, so, uh, precision ag kind of leads us to guidance, yield maps, 
um, looking at soils uh, across uh, different landscapes from a zone or, or you know, grid sampling uh, type of scenarios, um, using yield and, and, and satellite or remote sensing for creating different, different zones. So it's, it's a very broad term. And I think each one of those components is more or less adopted across, uh, across Canada and other regions of the world. Um, when we look at guidance, guidance is quite largely, uh, you know, quite broadly adopted across, uh, um, uh, you know, across Western Canada and, uh, and most of North America. Um, and, you know, you know, that's leading to less overlap and, uh, and helping, you know, with, you know, the discussion around carbon and those sorts of things. I think uh, um, more broadly using yield maps and remote sensing for uh, looking at different areas of the field and adjusting rates, um, um, variable rate application um, becomes less, less utilized. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, while the technology is getting more widely available and just like, you know, when we used to buy a vehicle and buy a Garmin and stick it to the windshield, today much of that technology is coming in, in, uh, installed from the factory. And so we're getting more technology on the farm, uh, but there still is some hurdles to, to make that technology utilized. Uh, first of all, connectivity uh, to uh, um, to you know, make it accessible, making it easier to move uh, data to and from the field. Um, complexity of of trying to get all of those components to work together and uh, and to accomplish what would, what the farmer wants to wants to accomplish. And the last piece is the value that the farmer is getting. I think all three of those are improving rapidly. We're seeing uh, we're seeing adoption. We're seeing more services, more people in the industry helping helping farmers kind of overcome some of the complexity so they can realize the value of precision ag. Um, we're not there yet. We're by no means saturated. We've got, uh, we've got a ways to go, but uh, uh, we're making great strides. I, I'm going to uh, play the moderator and, and ask my own question to follow up on that. Cause I'm, I'm really curious about uptake and that whole connectivity issue. And is so, Who's working on making sure that is going to happen? And are there solutions out there? I know nothing about this. So are there solutions that are um, like very local to, to somebody's farm operation? Or are we reliant on, say, the services of uh, big internet packages or whatever? Yeah, I think so. When we look at uh, um, broadband connectivity or four G or five G networks, I, you know, I don't think uh, the most of of the farming community is is holding out uh, any near term hope for five G. I mean, that's you know, that's moving into the big cities. So we're reliant on on uh, um, lower bandwidth, uh, um, and and that's just fine. Uh, there, you know, but we still struggle in all parts of. Of North America, let alone the rest of the world, in uh, in having uh, solid bandwidth, uh, you know, there's there's more and more applications today that aren't uh, that are um, uh, you know that are uh, um, in a native position, so that they don't need to be live connected to the internet at all times. Um, but it certainly helps as we're trying to make decisions real time as we're going across across the fields. Um, so you know. For the most part, we are relying on on you know the the cell coverage. Um, you know there are some some localized networks uh, using uh, wide area networks or LoRa networks. That, you know those types of types of connectivity where we can get more IoT sensors uh, connected and uh, and uh, connect farmyards. Uh, but when we're looking at field applications, largely we're reliant on cell coverage. Cool. Okay. Um, should I keep going with you or should I mix this up? <laughs> Steve Shirtliff, I think you, I think you started to answer that, or you answered this partly, but Steve Shirtliff was asking, how is remote sensing being used to monitor, measure, access, carbon capture and storage? Yeah. So I'm by no means an expert on, yeah. on remote sensing, but, uh, you know, um, I, from my perspective, it seems like we continue to have challenges in, um, measuring carbon in soils. Um, 
and the, and equating the the data that we're recovering from remote sensing and other imagery tools, whether it's it's near Earth or or in orbit, um, to equate to real life measurements and and the whole the whole realm of measuring carbon is a challenge. Um, you know, most of the like the combustion tests are are using very small amounts of soil for for um, creating the measurement and. And so the measurement is accurate. The lab test is accurate. I'm not trying to say that that's not accurate, but having a test that is representative of, of soils because of the variable nature of soils, it's very difficult to try and equate, you know, the lab test to, to what we're seeing. Even the imagery we're seeing, you know, there's so much variability in soils from a bulk density standpoint you know, soil texture and, and trying to calibrate all of these models is, has been a challenge. I, you know, we would love this to, to happen. We need accurate, scalable measurement techniques uh, to, to really get away from, from modeling. And today, from a, from a carbon credit and a carbon measurement standpoint, we're really relying on modeling. And really, it's a, it becomes an estimate of the amount of sequestration that's, that's happening. Um, it's obviously less desirable. It leaves us open to interpretation and, and different people kind of uh, having their say on what we're seeing. And from a farmer's perspective, um, coefficients that, that um, take into account the variability in the data um, reduce the data, carbon yield. Um, so as farmers are trying to monetize the techniques and the management practices that they're they're employing it's a real challenge because um, you because those those um, those tools need to be valuable enough for the farmer to do the work necessary to gather the data and to and to employ the techniques and so the higher the yield of carbon the better the you know more you know more monetary value for the farmer and I think as we're as we're trying to incent farmers to take meaningful climate smart initiatives. Um, if those initiatives are uh, monetarily valuable, it's it's you know it's it's far better, obviously. So um, you know, so we would love to have uh, accurate measurement that we can all agree on. And again, I you know I state we we would love to see the science community come together with regulators and and registries to to give us clear guidelines of of what we can implement in the field, and uh, um, and the industry stands ready to to uh, uh, to move forward. Shoot, sorry, I lost my mute. Um, yeah, I'm struck by that slide you had about how well Alberta has these and then you've got Saskatchewan and then you've got all of Canada and then we've got all the other provinces. It's so divis, like potentially yeah. divisive and I can't imagine getting everybody to agree, <laughs> especially these days. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's, uh, I was just in a conference and talking about Canada and the patchwork of different initiatives and, and regulations and, uh, and discussions. Uh, I was in California and they were talking about how California and, and Quebec are tied. Ontario had originally been a part of that and then, and then pulled out and then Alberta's doing its own thing for companies and for farmers. I think, you know, it, you know, we, uh, Again, our, our industry would like to participate. We we would like to have some clear direction of of what um, what we can do to to help with this file. I think uh, in agriculture, we we want to be part of the pro the solution, not the problem. And uh, um, and and we don't want to. Uh, you know, I think there's there's fear in 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 a risk of coming out too bold. And you know, and saying we're we're doing something that may come in to refute, and so you know, we really do need some clear guidelines from from regulators and and the science community to give some clear direction of what you know what we should be doing. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, I'm going to give you a break, and um, there's a couple questions here for Ari that are somewhat related. One's from Carl, one's from from Andy. Um. So Carl's wanting to know, could a future system integrate the analysis between the scale of UAVs and the scale of satellites? And then Andy followed up with, and then link the other way to in-field high resolution scale. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, are you there? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, sure. So uh, thanks, Carl and Andy, for those great questions. Uh, I believe there's great potential for using both satellite immersion and UAV immersion in a single integrated system. Uh, for example, for the most part, we know that uh, the UAV immersion is already geotagged, so we know the locations. Or at least in the most basic sense, uh, we gave those we get those locations through the metadata given us through by the breeders. So we can use that to set up the specific areas of interest and just to give us an idea of what we're interested in in an area. And we can use that as a starting point to then expand our analysis areas through the satellite imagery. So since we can get similar vegetative indices through the satellite imagery, and we can also get a wider range of data, just to name one, like weather data from satellites, I believe that using both in a single integrated system will definitely help us improve modeling so that was, should be something that we should be exploring in, in the future for sure. And to follow up on Andy's question, we can definitely do it the other way around us as well. Let's say we're interested in, in an overview of, of, let's say, Saskatchewan. We can get an overall sense of how a uh, growing season is going. And then with that, we can identify an area that we might be interested in, and then use our UAV image drones to go into a specific area and, and truly drill down into what's going on in an area is to be able to model a little better, improve the resolution, which is a little bit harder on satellite imagery. So using, again, using both in conjunctions would definitely help uh, improving our, our data sets. And, and to follow up then, how um, is it pretty straightforward or is this gonna be computationally huge to try and make all those connections, not necessarily in real time, but in fairly short order, to actually then be able to make sense of the data at every scale that we're looking at? Uh, I believe it shouldn't be that much more harder. I mean, we already have the plot vision system in place and I've been uh, having a little bit of experience inside of that imagery using Google Earth Engine. So there's Python wrappers for both and I believe we can connect them both. So it shouldn't be that much more uh, harder to get the different levels of analysis for both UAV and satellite imagery. Okay, thanks. Um, Albert, are you there? Um, Carl is asking, is it possible for the FAIR principles to provide enough benefit to researchers that they will follow these principles without regulation? <laughs> There are costs associated with following FAIR. So how can um, doing this pay for itself? In other words, how do we, I guess, how do we incentivize researchers to do this other than goodwill? To an individual, uh, there are benefits associated with uh, FAIR practices. For example, um, if um, if an individual researcher has um, put up a high quality data that can be findable and accessible online, it could reduce the uh, research duplication. If if if, if uh, another researcher wants to replicate that, that that particular research, it could reduce time and um, effort and, and funding. Again, if that can be shared, it can also enhance research collaboration between two individuals or even two institutions. Again, um, application of fair principles, though for, for, for an individual to do this, there has to be policies in place. For example, there has to be common standards. There has to be, I mean, individuals has to be, they, they have to be recognized. You don't just, just like publication, they have to be cited and recognized that there has to be incentives at the organization level for individuals to uh, adopt some of these practices. Of course, we all know that, um, 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 depositing data in the repository and getting high quality data of that such standard, they are associated with cost. They need infrastructure. And as, as we all can attest that most scientists can't even afford those infrastructure. So in that case, the institutions and the funders, they have a very big role to play in providing them for, for, for use by, by other, other scientists out there. Oh, good, thanks. Um, back to Ari, um, this is again from Carl. 
Thank you, Carl, for asking all these questions. Um, for the E part of G by E, so gene type by environment, E being environment, here I go lecturing as a plant breeder. Um, are you planning to integrate environmental sensing into the Explorer application so that researchers can actually take E into account as they explore? Absolutely, uh, adding environmental sensing is overall being able to add environmental factors into the analysis processes can give us greater insights as to why we get the results that we do. Uh, sure, we can often remember like the environmental condition of a given year, but as we're hoping that this is a multi-year data project that's available for many years after now, we're not gonna remember what the conditions were five years ago. So that just makes it so much more important to be able to have this data available uh, in the system just for as long as it's alive. So we already had initial plans and discussions about adding it and how to integrate it. And hopefully it'll be a feature that we're gonna have in the next few months. Super, thanks. Um, Tuan, uh, Ian's asking, it's nice to see results across different crops. In your experience, which have been the most challenging images to work with? And I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Ian, for the question. Yes, uh, we uh, scratch uh, our head uh, a lot. Actually, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, but uh, so far, what uh, we are working on is uh, an, a project on uh, weed detection. Actually, that is uh, we use a very high uh, resolution RGB image uh, that take a lot of time for training. And we have to annotate a lot. Uh, however, the application of this training sample to the image in other sites or other image date is not uh, the output is not quite well yet. So we are working very hard on that. Yes, I, I think high um, RGB image uh, are very good, but it 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 has it uh, very difficult to process data. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Um... Keshav, nobody's hit you up yet. I've got a question for you. Um, is there a tangible advantage to using hyperspectral imaging in a regular plant breeding program as opposed to, I can kind of see where you'd have it in, in, in um, say a genetic study maybe, but from, from a plant breeder standpoint, do we, are we getting to, when we get to hyperspectral, is it just too much information and not really practical for number crunching sort of on the fly, like we kind of would like to have in a plant breeding program. And would it be, would the trade-off of good enough from a multi-spectral camera uh, be fine in the breeding program? Uh, thank you, Christian, for asking uh, the question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I was waiting for the question and I was wondering, like, I covered a lot of case studies so that uh, it doesn't um, go to the audience. Um, uh, you are right, like, hyperspectral uh, having a different umbrella of, like, starting from acquiring the images to uh, until get the results. So it depends upon which kind of objective or the traits we are asking for. So uh, so I can say everything is not possible when we are talking about the RGB, RGB images or the multispectral. So they need to be an in-depth research coming from the hyperspectral when we talk about the vegetation indices uh, thing. So from where they, those come. So they are specific targeting the, our objective or the traits. When we are talking about the disease, uh, the kind of the disease, this is the hyperspectral sensor, which are getting like very narrow spectrally band information. And, uh, and we can say like these band is influencing uh, these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, like changes in, in the particular crop and those kind of things. So at the end, what I'm trying to say here uh, is, is depends upon uh, choice of the sensor and choice of the traits or objective. And if we are talking about the traits or very broadband kind of a study that uh, suits well uh, under the umbrella of RGB or the multispectral, when we are talking about the genetic side uh, understanding like uh, photosynthesis, uh, how the stomata uh, closing happens and all those kind of very in-depth uh, Research is starting from hyperspectral, but it's uh, always expensive when we talk about hyperspectral and is always uh, having the big data side of the aspects because it contains a lot of three dimension information from X and Y is a spatial and the, and the lambda axis is a Z axis with a spectral axis. So it needs a different uh, like a specific treatment, I can say to handle the data. And it's very specific need to be uh, addressed on the calibration point of view also when we are acquiring the data. 
So uh, I need like uh, a series of uh, different staff from uh, from acquiring the data, calibration, and 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 giving the importance of the band with the, uh, with training the model and all those kind of things, and addressing the uh, uh, like your question specific. So I'm just uh, want to say uh, what is our objective and traits, and 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 make the choice from there on. Like uh, select the, your sensor, select the the suitable platform, and go from there. Uh, so there is a importance and there is a uh, there's things uh, which is always uh, uh, there is a high perspective. We need a high perspective camera for that. I'm saying thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I kind of guessed it would be something like that, which sort of leads me to a question, um, maybe not directed necessarily at Keshav, but also the others um, would be. You know, as a as a plant breeder, we're running operations and and. Uh, if we're going to invest in this, it's going to be a big investment because we're going to need compute, right? And so is this something that's really tractable for a small breeding program to get into all of this? Or do you think this has to be done at a, at a higher level where we can tie into bigger compute and um, resources through, through more collaborative methods, I guess? Does that make sense? And any of you can jump in because it's one thing to do a genetic study, right? One-off studies and so on, but it's quite another thing to be running. We're, we're, you know, the cereals programs are running tens of thousands of plots, hundreds of thousands of plots per year is one thing. And then there's other smaller programs that would like to make use of this technology, but they're, you know, they, they're not at that scale. And so how much investment is it going to be? And I'm not asking dollar figure. I'm just saying, is it a huge investment for, for smaller programs to get in on this action? That could be answered by Keshav. That could be answered by Ari, Tuan. Maybe even Albert is the economist. <laughs> wants to lay in? I don't know. So uh, Christian, if I, uh, I can jump a little, like if I understand <laughs> your question, like making that like, on what basis we can, for the small scale study, we make the choice of, of the technology? If I'm addressing it. Well, so, no, not even studies. I'm talking about actual um, breeding programs. So we're, we're not doing genetics anymore. We're just screening material at this point, right? But it's still going to end up um, involving compute and, and so on, right? So it's an investment. And is it, how do you convince, let me flip it, let me, you know, ask a different question then how do you convince a breeding pro a breeder who is running not some multi-million dollar program but a smaller program um that this is worth investing in and that it's not you know and to keep up the investment uh yeah so i kind of understand what you're trying to say is like uh, with the limited resources or the things how one can adopt this new technologies which we are uh, daily talking in the market right now so this yeah. is a good question and there's a uh, there's a lack of adaptability in the market uh, uh, we can all see when we are talking about the farmers and all those and those are kind of like when we talk about the crop, crop breeders this they are quite well trained uh, in what they are doing in the field already so how we are bringing something different, what they are already doing in, in the things. And when I see the importance of the technology, in, in, in uh, so I started with, uh, if you are a like very expert in a crop breeding side and you have hired uh, some summer student to do the rating in the summer season, so you can be the uh, unbiased as a single person, but when you compared all those uh, ratings data from different people that can be biased in terms of how they got trained in the short term. So the technology, play an important role in those sense, uh, getting a very precise unbiased data set and making the very accurate prediction without uh, uh, without uh, like a very fast and uh, computation in the, it is always completely expensive and need a set of uh, like um, uh, understanding how to handle the data and what need to be there in computational side and, and productive side. So like when I talk about high perspective, so I cannot go in the market and say everyone buy the high perspective because it doesn't suit well for saying that. But as soon as we do as a as an entity, as a researcher, we do some uh, indoor imaging uh, uh, prediction uh, study using the high perspective and then bring out in a ma many maturized form like a multi spectral. So that is is quite cheap, like 10 times cheaper than high perspective. So we can minimize our 
uh, rare. We can minimize our like you are saying the pricing for them. And if the, uh, some there is a specific trade as I, I was uh, told, we know the specific uh, objective, and then we can uh, tell them these are the sense in technology you can adopt, which is the which is uh, suits well for your need on the market, like nutrition analysis, what they want to retrieve the nitrogen uptake in the plants. So go with this um, this kind of sensor, which is quite cheap. Do not need to be go very expensive way, like high spatial resolution, 100 megapixel phase one or the hyperspectral camera. You can just buy a $5,000 uh, multispectral bands or, or can order the specific sensor. On, on. So those those are uh, those are the things we can propose uh, for the farmer's point of view as, as the research will on go in the market. Yes. Maybe Ari could weigh in. I'm I'm just, it's sort of along the same lines is, are we at the point right now where we could um, market a package to a plant, to plant breeders at a reasonable cost that, that gets them everything? They don't have to know anything. They just have to say, okay, I'm going to get these data. They know what to do with the data once they, it's all extracted, but there's this, and, and they can probably find somebody who could fly the drone and get, and get the, the images, there's that spot in between where I can tell you most plant breeders don't even want to think about what's happening between there that point. And I just want to look at numbers on my spreadsheets, right? So are we there yet? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I can answer to that. Uh, since plot vision is pretty much an automated process after you upload the images, I believe we can provide that service to uh, anyone that's interested. Uh, you just got to upload the images, click on a few buttons, and use letter system do what it does best. And you get the results, both in a, in a simple spreadsheet, like you said, but we've also built this entire tool to explore the actual field just recreated with the images. And that gives you a better insight to, as to what's going on as well. So uh, I believe that's already, in, all that is already in place. Uh, we just got to do... Uh, probably a, a little bit expand a little bit more on marketing it in, as a tool that, that that will help breeders. Uh, and is there any intent? Do you know um, to actually package it up with a drone and a camera? And here's the whole package, not just the, that intermediate piece, but the whole package. Uh, I yeah, that's probably outside I, outside what I handle. That's probably more of a question <laughs> to William rather than me. <laughs> But uh, that's definitely a great idea to explore, and I'll definitely follow up with that. All right. Okay, enough of my questions. In a little bit more. Do you want to array in there? Um, um, yeah, I'm looking at it from the economic perspective, and um, just like I'm, I'm trying to put a, a typical small scale breeder in the position of a typical farmer. Mm -hmm. I think the, the first, every farmer looks at the cost of adopting a particular technology. But you, as the founder or uh, at the institutional level or the government or whoever, the donor agencies, the first thing you have to do is create the do a kind of let the breeder know of the benefits that comes from, from that technology as against the cost. If the benefit as well as the cost, the breeder can even go to the extent of maybe even getting a loan from somewhere or maybe have a possibility of collaborating with a large scale breeder. So, so what, what really drives the breeder's uh, uh, adoption decision has to do with the, the benefits. If the benefits outweigh the costs, I believe the breeder will definitely adopt the technology. Yeah, and I, 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 we could throw that all the way up to Darren. It's the same question with, with, um, with farmers adopting the, your technologies, right? It, well, I was little say, guys, maybe not so much, but the big guys, it's easy for them. Well, I don't know. I, I, I was going to you know, um, jump in as well, because I think it's the same question on farms. Like, hmm. uh, the, these, like the, um, the drone imagery, hyperspectral imagery is available on farm. There's a number of companies uh, talking about doing it. Uh, the, the question comes back at farm level is what problem are we trying to solve and what decision am I going to make? And, and uh, you know, whether I'm using satellite imagery, just Sentinel or, you know, some free, free image or something very high resolution, like a, like drone imagery, um, it really comes down to, you know, what is the value equation of the decision I'm making? And for most 
broad acre farmers in Saskatchewan and across Western Canada, the, the value equation of the decisions that they're making is, uh, um, is challenged with the, the expense of the, of the image. And, uh, um, and similarly with uh, using the image for scouting or identification of, of different diseases or, or, um, or areas of the field, it, it's, it's challenged. And I, and I think that's why we're not seeing real broad adoption. I, I think we're seeing it in, in isolated areas. I'm on a on an organic farm in Arizona right now, and they're using imagery to, to really identify on very small scale. And maybe that's more applicable to plot work that, that you folks are doing. But, uh, um, but when you get into broad acre, um, the, the cost of acquisition of the, of the imagery is, uh, um, can be prohibitive depending on what decision we're making. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if it's, uh, you know, yes, we can get that data, but do we really need it is, yeah. is the bigger question. And, and at what point, yeah, do you tip into that investment? And it's, you know, I suspect a lot of people who are do- early adopters are the, I'm, I'm cool doing this kind of, they're not doing it necessarily from a financial standpoint, but from a, well, let's test this out and, but I, I think we're, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I no, think no. where we are starting to see it is uh, is on some seek and spray type of uh, scenarios where we can drastically reduce the amount of pesticide that's being applied. Mm-hmm. And as uh, that technology is gaining more momentum and uh, and more smarts, uh, and we can be more reliant on it, then uh, you know, then that's that's taking place. We're seeing it starting with drones to identify plants and then. And then go in and analyze the information and make prescriptions and, and go out to the field and, and react to those prescriptions. And even real time, uh, we've, we've got a technology that a lot of work was done in Saskatchewan with we, uh, uh, Green Seeker. Uh, today, we use it as, uh, as more of around weed identific- and identification for, uh, for deciding when to spray. But if we can drastically reduce the pesticide load, there is a strong value equation on that side. Yeah, no kidding. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's stop with my questions and see what else is in the chat here. Oh, while we got you here, Darren, um, Carl's asking, do you see digital soil mapping becoming common at the producer level? And does Trimble have technologies that could be used for this combination of topography, composition, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so we, we did see it get quite adopted, especially with EC mapping and the, and the extrapolation around EC mapping. A lot of people were using Varus in the field, the, you know, a couple different types of, of those types of tools. Um, the challenge again was data acquisition, the cost of going out and, and going across the field, gathering the information. Um, and we, we, you know, in our, you know, what we found was uh, using remote sensing, we could get a lot of uh, zone, um, zone calibration and zone identification using remote sensing in a, in a, a more effective way. And so um, um, I think we've, we've seen that technology get, get, um, you know, get adopted more or less in different areas. We're starting to see more um, work being calibrated. So taking soil information and topography information and satellite and yield information and, and calibrating all of those things together. And as the tools get more, um, get easier for agronomists and farmers to use, I think, uh, you know, there's a desire to really dial in those zones to make sure that we're getting a good ROI when we make management decisions based on those different zones. So um, um, you know, Trimble has, um, uh, you know, some very high end uh, um, soil, uh, you know, soil sampling equipment called the um, SIS soil information system. Um, not used very broadly, used in some specialty markets and, uh, and in some regions. Um, again, the cost of acquisition gets, uh, can get prohibitive for broad scale. And, uh, um, and that's, that's a challenge with, uh, with many of these technologies until they, until they do hit scale. Um, is some of this, could, could you use that though as a tie it in at a broader scale that this isn't something that would be 
you know, unique to individual operations, but maybe at a, the gov- at a government level or something where they are using it, uh, tying it in with maybe some of the carbon capture type or, or carbon offset yeah. and so on. No, I think you're you're exactly right. I think there is a there's a lot of energy going into kind of broader views on carbon and and uh, um, and mapping and understanding how how all of these data sets can come together. Uh, I've been working with a, a, a panel um, in the lead up to the Food Systems Summit, and World Economic Forum has been working on digitization of of mapping and markets. And, you know, there's concept around one map where, where farmers could kind of plug into where they sit relative to their region and then make management practice improvements to be more climate smart um, and, and take a broad view, a global view even of, uh, of where that, you know, where that sits and then bring it back to a regional view of how can we use that information? Can we use that information to make better decisions on, on drought or excessive moisture, on, on pests and, uh, and other, other real world activities that are happening? So, you know, almost building out an early warning system for a region to know that it, um, that it needs to make different, different uh, practice alterations or management decisions. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work going on and I, and as we get more digitization on farm and, and really the democratization of, of digital ag, really kind of broad scale information and how can we pr- uh, plug in the, the private sector with the public sector to bring um, you know, better value to farms and, and farming regions. I know I'm lost. Uh, I'd like to go back. Thanks. Um, Ari, uh, Venkat has a question for you. Um, As a developer, what is your typical process in collecting requirements from plant researchers for the design of your tools in plot vision? Is it a traditional interview feedback loop or do you use different approach? A different approach and as a follow-up do you have any suggestions for other software developers doing the same uh, sure that's a, with both yeah. of you yeah <laughs> uh, that's a great question Venkat yeah you're right uh, the usual loop is to have one-on-one interviews with those that are interested in the tool and that's great to gather the initial requirements to initially build a prototype uh, but in my case, luckily, thanks to the close collaboration between Carl and Steve, I actually worked from Steve's lab for a period of time. So as you be, I was able to work from there and just be able to observe how people actually use the tool in their normal day-to-day process without having to force people into telling me what's going on, what do they like, and what's what's been helpful or what are the issues. So that gave us a great insight as to when is the tool actually needed, uh, what new feature we should add, what are people actually interested in. And I, I would definitely recommend that for anyone working with interdisciplinary teams to spend some time in your collaborator's lab or with their students, because you learn a lot from them. And I didn't know much about agronomy before I started, of course, and being able to immerse myself in their lab just gave me a legs up to learning all the, all the things I needed to build a, a tool like this. Good. Okay, I have a general question from Mikel del Castillo that you ask. They're asking, um, it seems that UAV is starting to get some momentum when it comes to plant sciences. And what do you, and this is a general question for anybody, what do you consider are the most common challenges when using this technology? And are there trade-offs that we should consider when implementing UAV in ag? Anybody want to take that one? Or I will just ask you guys randomly. I think I can, I can answer a little bit of that. Harry, you uh, want to dive in? Go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so one of the challenges that we often have uh, data sets of different sizes. So sometimes fields can be very small. So those are pretty easy to build in a simple application. But then we start getting uh, fields that are huge and many more plots to explore. So we need to uh, figure out a way 
so that our tools can be able to expand automatically without us having to, you know, go into the code and make sure everything fits in your screen and it's easy to explore, make sure the genesis behind the scenes also uh, happens smoothly. So of course, uh, different data sets that we usually want to automate, uh, sometimes we need to uh, first explore the data with the actual breeders and use and be able to know their requirements first and, and be able to build that into our pipelines. Keshav, do you have anything to add to that or Tuan? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. So Michael question is very valid. Like it's a general question for all the wide audience when we talk about for the new person or the farmers uh, about the UV technology. So uh, it's not about some momentum. I think it's pacing up a very high momentum in the agriculture field around the world globe. Uh, and there is a question of uh, why, like common challenges. So there is a series of challenges uh, when we talk about, uh, because this is new technology, it is a new thing and it's not well mature. Like when we develop our new algorithm, it is not uh, well established uh, where we are developing a local algorithm for a, a local image field, it can be valid for the different reason. So that's always a, a challenge about how we are refining the model, like what is going on in the weather prediction models. We are refining with their more data is coming and then we are refining our weather prediction model. So it's the same kind of uh, the things having the challenge on the market. How, uh, where is the access of the data? Is there an open source of uh, data? And if the lot of people like more researchers have the uh, hand on access of the data, they can refine their model. So the open data uh, sharing, uh, 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 open data sharing uh, method, uh, there is a, should be uh, something in place uh, from different organization, how the data can be openly shared with the different different people so that they can bring up uh, their ideas, they can refine the, the model. So that's why uh, we need to support the open source kind of the things, then treating it as a very personal data set. So there is a lot of things I uh, discussion going on in the market, how we can make the data available for the larger audience so they can, they can improve the model. So that's the one challenging part of handling the data and making availability to different researcher groups for the things. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, challenges in the technology, how we are treating um, um, the things before the data comes around. So because as soon as we talk about the new sensors, uh, it's not about just getting the data and dumping in the terabyte of, of the hard drives. It's how we are collecting the data. What is the set of accurate protocols? Uh, the quality of the data is also matters because at, at the end, the, all the results or all, all the all the um, all the objective is depends upon what is the quality of the data was collected at that time. So there is a, a discrete component. One need to be take care. Uh, these are all the, all the challenges uh, for the new person. If someone want to bring this sensing technology in, in their their program, how it see all different discrete challenges starting from uh, image acquisition, starting for treating the, the data, how to process the data and up to the getting the results. So all the challenges have different challenges. It comes up at a different uh, block of, uh, of when we talk about the UV technology. So, and, and components. So I'm just uh, looking the question. Uh, is similar. Uh, so there is some uh, trade-off uh, when we are uh, talking about this technology. So uh, UV in agriculture. So I didn't understand like uh, uh, quite a bit of like, uh, so trade-off means is a, uh, something uh, bringing in the, uh, we are starting in the sense, uh, bringing the new technology and there is, there is a kind of failure. Uh, we, we can always think about if something got failed. <laughs> Um, so uh, this is uh, this is a quite uh, a good question, but uh, it's uh, it's always like uh, adopting the new technology is uh, not all the time easy. Like I can say, uh, and there is always we need to consider uh, what could be the trade off uh, from uh, bringing this UAV in the agriculture field. I wonder if trade off um, would be in terms of well. Uh... If you've only got a fixed budget, there's only so much you can do. And is it worth throwing your lot in with the imaging technology or do we still need to be a bit cautious um, at this point in time? You know, just not those of us that are actually actively working on this right now, but some other researcher, um, you know, there is a trade-off because it means that you're spending it on these new tech, new possibly not quite, well, in your mind, un, in my mind, unproven technology, my mind as the, the, the person trying to make that decision, or do you feel like it's it's at the point where that's not a risk, I guess? And I guess it, yeah. I, 
I'm guessing your answer is going to be, well, it depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, so this is all, all, all comes up when there is a new technology comes in the market. If we see our life like 20 years or 10 years before, when we are talking about the remote sensing, just a theoretical term, and we are moving like how is going in the market and giving a lot of high throughput applications. So there is a not match. I can say this thing is not match. It's needed more refinement in algorithm and modeling. But there is a goal if we see from now on ourselves after 10 or 15 years, we can see the, the value of this technology is huge for the future care, like artificial intelligence, uh, remote sensing, everything will pacing up the uh, pacing up the labor market. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a comment here from Carl to me, it says, but that's um, and it actually was from a previous point. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to get back to this, but it, it comes in sort of here as well. And that is um, the technology is dependent on user issues. It has to fit into the constraints of a breeders or in this case, researchers program for now, we're still expensive enough that it might not work for a small breeder, but with a few years and the technology will be built into equipment and the compute could largely happen on the sensor itself. Right. So 10 and his point was, and this is so true, 10 years ago, who would have thought that we would have GPS to count our steps for fitness? And the same process hopefully will be happening with for the breeding programs or for for research programs as well. So, yeah, I think that's when it will. The tipping point will be when it's something that's in a package that's that's like that. All on our phone. Thank you. Well, let, let, let me come in a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, one thing uh, I want to use this issue of GM, GMO as a typical example. I don't know um, in, in getting new te- get, getting new technologies or them out, out out there for potential users. I don't know the level of engagement, uh, such as of uh, plant breeders or technology developers have with the end users. Uh, I think the, the ultimate goal is to adopt t- such technologies. And for end users, I think they should be carried along the development process. And along the line, some of us who are economists, we have a role to play to carry out some studies on the acceptance of such technologies. So that will give the developers a sense of, am I really in the right direction? Am I technology is going to be accepted? I think that there is need for proper collaboration between the plant scientists, the technology developer, and the, and the social scientists. It's really very important. Such collaboration is very, is very important because every profession has its own role to play. And on the data she mentioned by, by Sai, I think um, it has a very big role to play because uh, the issue of data sharing is just like getting data from a blood phenotyping and getting data from genotyping. Sometimes it's, it's, it's quite easy to, to integrate both data from different sources because uh, sometimes you, have, you don't have so common standards. That, that is basically what, what I presented because um, at the community level or each research domain should have their own unique standards, their own unique vocabularies. So it makes such things, makes data interoperability very easy. But when you have different standards, it's very difficult to share, even share data because if you share data, who is going to use it? The person may not even understand what they're talking about. So the issue of fair is, is, is really very important. And above all, collaboration is very important. Interdisciplinary research, just like they are doing in plant phenotyping, involving the social scientists, involving the plant scientists, involving the breeders and people from different uh, academic backgrounds, collaboration is, is really the key. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Anybody else want to weigh in on that before I change to a totally different question? All right. Um, this is this is a question for Darren. It's a very specific question um, from Reza Tui um, from USASC. I've developed a ground platform for phenotyping several crops. Precise mapping of monitoring fields is an important part of our system. Are you aware if similar technology has been developed and how, uh, of, sorry, are you aware of similar technology that's been developed and how they handle map creation? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would speak to the exact um, 
type of phenotyping that you're doing. I'm not sure about that, but uh, as far as creating maps and the accuracy of maps, uh, uh, Trimble has a number of, uh, of different levels of mapping accuracy potential. So um, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a number of different divisions. One of those divisions is a, um, is a survey division, which has incredibly high accuracy of uh, mapping capabilities. And, uh, and so, um, and, and some of those sensors that, uh, that um, can drive GPS mapping, even on your phone can be, you know, even can be plugged into your phone. And so um, it doesn't necessarily require um, any kind of, uh, um, you know, major hardware. There's, uh, there's the ability to do different levels of, uh, of accuracy of GPS in, uh, you know, depending on the application you're using. Uh, for example, we've been uh, um, using a, um, a regular um, software application, a mobile application that broadacre farmers use to record information in a particular zone or a particular field. Um, and then we've heightened the accuracy to get to uh, plant by plant record keeping for vineyards, for example. So by using a high accuracy GPS, we can identify which exact plant that, uh, that we're beside and then record information on that plant without having to have any kind of barcode or anything like that, just using simple GPS. Uh, I guess not simple, but uh, high accuracy GPS. So I'm wondering if something like that might uh, might be what you're looking for. Well, um, that kind of actually is somewhat, well, not really, but kind of related to the fact about um, taking the technology from other industries is um, one of Ian's questions was, um, can you speak about the translation of technology from other industries like construction, transportation, into ag and vice, is there any vice versa as well? Challenges, successes, what's going on there? Yeah, we've, uh, it's, a, it's a key effort for us. I work with our, our enterprise group uh, within ag, which means that we work with uh, larger operations, whether they're vertically, vertically integrated farming operations or uh, large scale um, operations. And, uh, and our group really, looks to solve that problem within Trimble. <laughs> and so uh, we've got, like I said, a transportation division. Uh, that transportation division focuses on large scale fleet operations. And of course, some larger farms have, uh, have uh, uh, fleets of, of tractors and trucks that, uh, that some of that software and some of those sensors are very applicable. Um, the example I just gave with Catalyst um, Catalyst is the name of the high accuracy sensor that is used in geospatial or survey work. Um, taking that and moving that sensor into agriculture is, uh, is uh, something we're doing. And when we start looking at carbon and carbon measurement and climate smart activities, um, our whole company is really coming together on how we can help all industries move forward in their management practices and making climate smart decisions and how we can collaborate on, on measurement and software and how, how companies can tell their story, their, their broader ESG story. Um, and uh, um, as I mentioned, I'm with a customer today and, and we were talking earlier about uh, uh, water management and uh, sensors and flow meters that our, um, our municipal group you know that's common practice in municipalities, but uh, but uh, some of that technology maybe is is, is available in agriculture. So, you know, I think we've got to you know, as farmers grow and as the complexity of farming grows, you know, I think uh, you know we're we're seeking for all kinds of different sensors and and ways of helping. Yeah, it's I I think it's really cool the way we can feed off of. Um, all the different when you know it's so much better when it's there's collaboration and we've seen this even under the perk that once we start collaborating we've everybody's got their strengths and we can start to feed off of each other it really makes makes for a much more um, pro productive um, route to to success I guess right I, I we find that in agriculture as well I, we, in our you know when in our old company agritrend we were 
you know, we've, we found by bringing different expertise together, um, you know, they felt like they were able to solve problems much more effectively than the silos that they used to exist in. So the entomologist was working with the soil scientist who was working with a, a weed specialist and, and, and somebody with remote sensing expertise. And how can we collaborate to, to figure out how nutrition plays a role in weed control and, and disease and insect control? Totally. Yeah. Actually, that's one of the things that I found really interesting in all of this has been being able to step back and look at what you do from a completely different angle and learn, you know, what, what is and what isn't possible and why it's not possible. Or although most of the time when they claim it's not possible, the computer science guys come back three months later and tell me, yes, it actually is possible, but they were lying, but they didn't, didn't want to over promise anything, <laughs> I think. Possible, yeah. maybe just not easily possible. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's three months possible. Yeah, not yeah. today. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we're running out of questions here. I've got one. I think I've only missed one, and this is for Keshav from Carl. Um, how sensitive is hyperspectral imaging to environmental factors such as sunshine, heat, albedo, and humidity? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Carl. Uh, so when we talk about hyperspectral, that's a very sensitive instrument itself. And it's very sensitive to all those things because whatever we are getting from the instrument at itself uh, is a very uh, high spectral resolve uh, well, uh, information of uh, like um, atmospheric gases or environmental features like uh, uh, heat, humidity, all those the things. And if we see uh, the research happen in the environmental industry, mostly uh, they talk about the uh, yeah, spectroscopy kind of uh, technology they are bringing to treat like different uh, gaseous states uh, in the atmosphere and all those. So I, I have a simple answer like, yeah, yes, it's very sensitive to all those uh, traits uh, like uh, which uh, the Charles have uh, mentioned here. Yes. But can, can you, um, can you handle it though? You must be able to handle it or this wouldn't be a useful technology. So handling, uh, can, well, you can you, can you account, I guess, account for it and and subtract or whatever, manipulate the, the data to, in order to be able to use it despite all of that? Yes, so that's that's a different question I can say because uh, when we talk about like, uh, suppose uh, uh, trace gases in the atmosphere or uh, soil carbon thing, it doesn't uh, have uh, like, possible when we are looking on the visual spectral side. So we need to have a sensor from near infrared to far infrared range so that we can trace all those uh, Gaussian com gaseous components like he heat effects, all uh, humidity or the carbon uh, amount in the atmosphere or in the soil. So uh, so I, I can say, uh, yes, uh, um, you can track, uh, trace all those different, um, uh, different features uh, in the spectral signatures. Uh, because uh, that's the spectroscopy uh, uh, comes as in the picture along with the imaging. Because hyperspectral is a, like having not only the imaging component, it's having very high weight of the spectroscopy component. So when we talk about the spectroscopy, then there is a lot of things uh, you can bring it uh, in the picture extra from RGB or multispectral uh, scale. All right, thanks for that. As, does anybody have any last questions? Does anybody from the panel want to ask somebody else from the panel a question? Or anything that you didn't say in your talk that you now want to add, <laughs> add having heard the other speakers? I think it's all good. I, I appreciate the opportunity to to spend some time with everybody today. And uh, um, if there's anything else that I can do to be of help to your group, please let me know. Yeah, I think I think we had a really good discussion going on here. And I thought it was really, I, at first when I was seeing the topics, I was wondering how this was all gonna come together. And I think we did a really good job of doing that. And I thank you um, all very much um for being here and presenting and uh answering these questions that have come from from the uh participants so i'd also like to thank everybody for joining us to today for this particular session and and hopefully you got to catch the other sessions 
and for taking part in the 2021 Perk Symposium. I'm going to hand it off to Ian Stavnis, who's the GIFs Enhancement Chair um, and the new head of the Perk program. And he will give some closing remarks for the whole symposium because this was the last session. So over to you, Ian. Great. Uh, thanks, Kirsten. Yeah, so I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this year's uh, PERC Symposium. We've had over 370 attendees uh, across 20 countries, so really, really great attendance. And over the past few days, we've had some really excellent presentations and really nice discussions, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I also have the pleasure of announcing the uh, poster awards for this year's symposium. Uh, so we voted on the top three posters, and they were Wheat Stripe Rust Estimation using UAV-based hyperspectral imaging by Keshav Singh, who was on the previous panel, uh, Steve Shirtleff, Hamadudu, and Randy Kutcher. Applying and Understanding Deep Learning Models that Predict Plant Phenotypes from Genomic Data by uh, Vadhi Lanke, Kirsten Bett, Larissa Ramsey, and Tony Kusilik. And Rapid Yield Predictions for Canola by Anjika Adanayak, Steve Shirtleff, Eric Johnson, and Hema Dudu. And then the coveted People's Choice Award, uh, who uh, audience members voted on, uh, goes to visualizing feature maps for model selection in convolutional neural networks by Saqib Mustafa, uh, Jody Mondal, and myself from USASC, and Michael Beck, Chris Bidnowski, and Chris Henry from the University of Winnipeg. And then I'd like to thank uh, all of the, the key people for, uh, for the symposium. So first I'd like to thank our keynote speakers um, for taking time from their very busy schedules to join us, to give really insightful presentations and very nice um, discussions. I'd like to thank the University of Saskatchewan for entrusting gifts with this event um, and for Perform Media for the very seamless online platform and, and the, the technical uh, work for this uh, event. I'd like to thank the PERC program committee and the organizing team at GIFS for uh, hosting the event and organizing. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to uh, thank David Conlin for his leadership in the organization and the tremendous amount of effort that he put in in the background um, to make this event um, uh, a successful. And then finally, I want to thank all of the graduate students, research associates, administrators, and faculty in PERC for all of your contributions over the past year. Um, it's been a very difficult time for everyone during the pandemic, um, but it's been, been particularly challenging for our international students and research associates who've been away from their family. The presentations and posters you've seen uh, in the symposium are really just a slice of, of all the activity happening at PERC, so I just wanted to acknowledge everyone's activity um, at, in this challenging time. So the recordings for the symposium are going to be available on the online platform for the next year. So if you missed a session and want to come back and watch, please do so. And please share these recordings with your colleagues who might be interested. I wanted to thank uh, Andy Sharp for his leadership in PERC over the past three years. Andy played a crucial role in the transition of PERC from phase one to phase two, the successful transition. And I'm excited to take over this uh, program director role from him. And then I wanted to close just by uh, saying that, you know, this really is an exciting time for the PERC program. We've been working hard to translate and deliver the research results and technologies from the program to the plant breeding programs at USASC, as well as to other stakeholders and industry partners. And we're starting to see the impact of those efforts. Um, and then, you know, we're also open for new collaborations and partnerships. So if you're interested in working with PERC, please reach out to me directly or contact us through the GIFS uh, Ag Tech portal. And with that, I'll just say, you know, thanks everyone for participating and all the best. <laughs>